every February is Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual and Transgender History Month. This year, it's been uh, the transgender cases that have been hitting their headlines. Last week, a High Court judge decided that the wife and children of a man who was now living as a woman should no longer have contact with their father in case they were excluded from their strictly orthodox Jewish community. And another woman transitioning to be a man decided to um, have a baby before continuing with her sex change, but objected to being called a mother by the nurses. Others have faced problems when placed in male or female prisons midway through their transitioning process. And on Friday, Russell Brand declared that he wouldn't be forcing gender on his baby daughter, Mabel. Should we have the right to decide our own gender? And, of course, the, the very verb is contentious, isn't it, Rachel? Because some people, it's not a decision for some people. It's absolutely what they are, and it's escaping from what they aren't. So forgive me the imprecision of language, but uh, there are many different cases and examples. What is life like for you now? Because last time you were on the programme, you were Richard. I was. Um, life is very good in, in and of myself. It hasn't been an easy process for those around me, but... Uh, uh, at times, but for me in myself, it's been uh, an incredible moment of liberation after a long, long struggle. Yeah. Uh, I lived with what we call dysphoria, gender dysphoria, which is a kind of angst um, for most of my life. And I remember my earliest memory, age four, was reaching into uh, the airing cupboard at home and pulling down my sister's uh, undies and putting them on and getting a real visceral thrill from that and a sense of rightness. And, and I lived with that. And um, it was really, really hard. I, I, at school, uh, I can remember a housemaster shouting across the rugby ground, Hoskins, you're a fairy. Um, and at the age of 15, uh, I sent off for hormones to Amsterdam. Quite an unusual thing to do at that age. Um, we're talking um, right at the beginning of the sort of 1980s. Wow. Um, and I sent off for hormones to Amsterdam. My father found, found the package when it came through the post, uh, clearly worried that something should arrive from Amsterdam, went absolutely ballistic and um, burnt it down the bottom of the garden. And I bottled it and lived like that for the next uh, 25 years or so. So it's so difficult for teenagers. I mean, it's better now, surely. There's more understanding. We'll, we'll speak to Susie soon about that. But so difficult for teenagers uh, living in a situation, for whatever reason they may be in an orthodox religious situation, yeah. parents just don't understand. For, for you, it was tough. So you, you understand the, the challenges yeah. now. Well, there must have been key moments in your life, <clears throat> excuse me, like because of anything gender segregated is is hugely contentious, isn't it? Prisons mm, yeah. and, and loos. What was the first time, do you remember, that you actually went to the ladies? or what, uh, Hospitals yeah. is another issue. Yeah, the first time I went to ladies was uh, actually on my first appointment to the Gender Identity Clinic, which uh, uh, I'm now part of that system. And the first time I went to the loo, uh, ladies in this country was, was on the way there. I mean, I think living with that dysphoria... It, was that it, a kind of moment in your life? Yeah, right? it yeah. was, yeah. it was. And mm. I've never had any problem going to ladies since. Um, mm. But I, I think that... Um, Living with that dysphoria is, is something that people need to recognise. We talk about whether it's a choice or not, but I could not be anything else but that. I you say society's too genderized as well. You've I, said that. Society's definitely too genderized. We, we fixate on you know, binary thinking. But, I mean, I would say to anybody who's watching the show that there, there is support in place. And what I did is, is what you should never do, which is I start, started self-medicating. I ordered drugs from abroad. Um, I was taking things without any knowledge of my blood um, you know, a situation. Yeah. I had no blood tests. I... I nearly killed myself unintentionally twice, um, and, I, and I was going through hell. This is from th just after I last appeared on the show. But now, the, uh, the Boy in the River was the book you were talking That's about. That's right. It was a fantastic book. Thank you. Um, but now, of course, there are people who understand, and there is help. Yeah. Peter Saunders from the Christian Medical Fellowship. Hi, Peter. Um, if an adolescent son or daughter of yours wanted to transition, um, what would you say to them? Let me talk about this as let a me, doctor. Let, please no. just answer the question, because no. there's various I, things I want to get through now. If a, if a teenage son or daughter of yours said that they wanted to transition, what would you say to them? Uh, I would encourage them not to do so. Let me talk about what this as a doctor. What would you say uh, to, in, 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 as part of your discouragement? What arguments would you make? Well, I would say it all de it depended about what our understanding of this whole phenomenon was. And I, I became acutely aware of this a couple of years ago when uh, one of our members, we have 5,000 members of CMF, she said, uh, she contacted me, she said, I'm a GP in a university town. I get one gender-conflicted teenager seeing me every day. They're all asking for referral to the Tavistock and Portman Clinic in London, and they're all on antidepressants. What do I do? Why do you believe that is happening? Uh, well, I think it's a, it's a new phenomenon. We've got to ask ourselves that. Uh, the, the Tavistock Clinic had 697 referrals in the year ending March 2015. It doubled to over 1,400 last year. 
That included 167 children aged 10 or less and three children aged three is or less. Is it a new phenomenon or is uh, just, it, it, just no a recognition of it? I mean, I, listen, I, I, look, think we, I think when we see... Is this when, not, Peter, as a man of God, is this not a wonderful, God-given, glorious spectrum of gender? I mean, God is gender non-specific. <laughs> No, I, I think God's very clear that he created people in his own image and did it male and female. Yeah, but that, but I, mean, I think that cannot well, mean parts of the body. I'm sorry. I, I remember a Baptist deacon saying to me years ago, you know, there's an awful lot of people that think God has a penis. That is clearly ridiculous, theologically ridiculous. Uh, I'm talking here about Christian theology. Whatever gender means in a theological sense, it cannot mean uh, bits of the body. God is not about bits of the body. And that Adam and Eve part <laughs> is about relationships. <laughs> When Kathy, Kathy's, when Kathy's coming in. Have a think, have a think. Oh, a bit. Kathy, yeah. This is a war on reason and a war on science and a war on men and women. This is sort of extraordinary. Nobody has a problem with accommodating people who are transsexual. But what's happening with the current fashion and why these numbers have gone up that Peter refers to is this has become an ideology that's being imposed, an intolerant like a ideology. Is it fa a fad, do you think? It's, it's an ideology, a, absolute, a fashion, but an ideology is driving the fashion and people are being naive in accepting it. Because if, this, if you were talking about creationism, everyone here would be outraged that you'd say evolution doesn't exist. Believe you me, they wouldn't. Sex <laughs> is binary. Um, Sex yeah. is binary. No, the term gender is a leftist term designed to confuse. Excuse me, it is. Susie, this is uh, the truth. It's XX and YY apart from point nothing percent of the population and there is a this this doesn't uh, mean to say transsexuals don't so, so, well, no, well, hang, hang on, Richard. Su Susie Green CEO of Mermaids charity supporting trans children and young people mother of a trans girl when you hear that it's an ideology and it's a fad and it's a fashion and life gender is binary what would you say sex is binary sex I... is binary sorry what would you say to... I am not the sum of my parts and neither is anybody else mm. And, and, that it, and, and the fact is, is that, you know, I represent hundreds, hundreds of families and hundreds of young people who struggle with this daily. This is not a choice. This is not something that is chosen as fashionable. We know that those young people are incredibly at risk for suicide and self-harm. This is not something anybody would choose. It is incredibly difficult to come to terms with. Families struggle with this, often for years before they seek help for their children. And those children themselves often are absolutely refused any sort of acceptance by their own parents and those are the young people that are at the highest risk. We know that parental ex acceptance and support means these young people function better. We know that we have fully functioning members of society who go forward to live happy lives. The thing that I really can't understand is why is it anybody else's business? What is your business Peter? Happy lives. <laughs> Peter, we're only we're only here once. Not everyone believes, but, it, it, but it's a lot. Yeah, more we're only here once. Let's enjoy. Let's be who we are. It's a let's, lot more you know. complex. It's a lot more complex than that. Is it? It, it is. Gender dysphoria is a real medical condition which causes great distress and needs to be handled very carefully. Do you think it's a but, psychiatric condition? No, but, but when we get to the situation oh, where gay icons like Peter Tatchell and feminist icons like Germaine Greer are being labelled transphobic bigots and getting no platform at British universities and denied freedom of speech simply because they've made, they've expressed the view that trans women are not real women, then I think you've got to realise there's a massive new form of political correctness on the block and a huge cultural Sarah, change taking place. And the medical profession's changed its view on this as well. I think largely for, for ideological and political reasons uh, in order to appease the LGBT lobby. swept in a tide of political correctness. Sarah, why, are, why do some feminists have a problem with this? And what is their problem? The big problem is that there's such a massive lack of clarity about what we're actually talking about when we talk about gender. So feminist analysis is that you have sex, which is male and female, and you have a class system of gender, which is men and women, and you're socialised through your life to either grow up to be a man with all the attributes that men are supposed to have or to be a woman with all the attributes that women are supposed to have. And women are inferior and men have more power. And that's the feminist analysis. The problem with this idea that you're a woman because you feel like a woman inside or a man because you feel like a man inside is that essentially what that says 
is that men have power because they're innately supposed to have power and women have less power because we're innately supposed to have less power and that's really not a feminist you know that is a very anti-feminist argument to be making and that doesn't say anything about whether people should be protected from discrimination and violence they absolutely should it doesn't say anything about whether people should be allowed to you know choose their names, live their lives, wear the clothes that they feel happy with, have surgery for dysphoria. All of those things are, you know, absolutely acceptable and necessary for individual people. But what we can't give up is this understanding that gender in society operates as a class system to women's disadvantage and men's advantage.